Hello and welcome to Tech for Non-Techies, the only podcast that demystifies the fast-growing technology sector. I'm your host, Sophia Madriera, Chicago Beef MBA and tech entrepreneur. My aim here is to give you the skills, knowledge and confidence to find opportunities in the tech sector, whether that's through founding a company, getting a dream job or bringing a fresh perspective to your work. Hello. In this episode, you are going to hear Professor Marco Iancitti speaking about the business of artificial intelligence. Professor Iancitti teaches AI and innovation at Harvard Business School, and he's the author of Competing in the Age of AI, Strategy and Leadership When Algorithms and Networks Run the World. I absolutely love the book, and if I can understand it, so can you. One of my favorite subjects at university was ancient Greek theater. So if somebody who studied ancient Greek theater can understand a book about AI, then you certainly can. What you're about to hear is an excerpt from a masterclass that Professor Ian Siti taught on Tech for Non-Techies. If you want to get access to the full masterclass, as well as the slides, then you'll need to sign up to the membership. But this session is already a great intro on what AI is, how it impacts organizations, and you're also going to get a case study on how AI is impacting the financial services industry in China. And of course, we talk about the acceleration of using AI in the times of COVID. So without further ado, here's Professor Yan Siti. AI, the AI that we're seeing deployed these days is actually pretty simple. Uh, it's not the stuff of science fiction. Is not uh, sentient beings and things like this. It's called uh, essentially weak AI. So computer scientists think of this as a relatively basic type of artificial intelligence, which is essentially some simple instructions, simple algorithms, uh, working with a bunch of data that are performing tasks that humans once performed. And so that's a definition of a kind of artificial intelligence, uh, which is very broadly applicable. And we find this everywhere. These days, literally, when you stare at your phone and use your popular apps, uh, this kind of AI is firing up every functionality that you are making use of. Very different from the kind of strong AI that is the stuff of science fiction. So we don't have robots running around uh, in our society, at least not normally, uh, certainly not acting like humans in ways that we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. <clears throat> so we don't have any strong AI out there, uh, and it's out there uh, years away. But the stuff that we have is relatively simple AI that is already changing everything that we see around us. Our world is being transformed. Our economy is being transformed by the deployment of artificial intelligence. Another interesting thing about AI is that you can take algorithms from lots of different kinds of development areas and use them in completely different application uh, areas. And it's done all the time. Um, what happens when you put many, many of these algorithms together to really form the foundations for a company? <clears throat> this is fundamentally the story of Ant Financial. So Ant Financial is a financial service institution in China. Starts off with a payment system called Alipay. Uh, Alipay started off uh, with Alibaba, and uh, right now it gradually has been scaling up. In 2013, it was spun out in a company called Ant Financial. And Ant Financial is essentially uh, Alipay's data integrated with a bunch of other data that it is then packaged up as an integrated platform and then used to launch myriads of additional services and lots of additional businesses. And so with Ant Financial, you get UABAO, which is the first thing, which is a, a money market fund, which today has become the world's largest money market fund. Uh, you have Gima Credit, which is today's one of the largest credit rating systems in the world. My bank, one of the largest loan granting facilities in the world and so on and so forth, while Alipay itself has grown to 1.2, 1.3 uh, billion users and is now the largest payment system in the world. And, and an organization like this, I mean, how could an organization like this scale in just a few years and drive so many different businesses? Uh, and the reason is that it's built different. So if we go and look inside the box and say, what happens inside a financial and how does this company actually work? Uh, it turns out it's built on very different foundations than traditional firms. And the way we understand this is we look at business models, we look at operating models. So business model is what a company tries to do, how it tries to capture value, how it tries to create value in the first place so that it can capture something. 
Um, it's basically the strategy and the marketing side of the company where you think about strategy and then pricing and how do you actually uh, make the, so try to make money and, and try to, to, to make customers happy. The value proposition, if you like. The operating model is the hard part. Um, the operating model is all the you know tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people, uh, systems, technologies, processes, capabilities that deliver that value to the customer. You know, whether the actual capabilities that make the car, the capabilities that design and deliver the financial services that you want to offer, and so on. So the operating model, in some ways, is really how the company gets stuff done. Now, in a company like Ant Financial, the operating model is built on a fundamentally different foundation. So rather than having a bunch of different people sitting around in their organizations, um, moving processes around and, and trying to figure out how to serve customers and trying to figure out how to manufacture parts and so on. The core of the operating model is essentially a bunch of software. Uh, it's a bunch of algorithms powered by data that are accumulating uh, data from different sources, uh, <clears throat> uh, abstracting from it, packaging it up so that people can deploy it to do various business processes. And the core of the company fundamentally is really is a bunch of data and software that delivers the functionality that, uh, that, the, uh, that the customers want. Like, for example, when Ant Financial awards a loan, it does so uh, with a one-second process. So you, it takes three minutes, apparently, to do your loan application, and the decision is back to you in one second, 24 hours a day, done without any human intervention whatsoever. It's basically just an algorithm that figures out whether or not you're, you, know, you have the right credit and so on. Uh, and that's how these companies work. And so basically you take the people and the human capital and the labor that's involved in a traditional company and move them off the critical path uh, in delivering the value. So the value itself is delivered by an algorithm. Those humans are designing the algorithm, managing the algorithm, making sure the algorithms are working properly, lots of stuff to do, but not on the critical path of actually getting the operating uh, model to, to connect with the customer. So not, not on the critical path of delivering value. In, in Satya Nadella's own words, AI is in your runtime. And runtime is kind of like a geeky, nerdy word for the execution engine, right? So the runtime of a computer essentially is the part of the software that goes out there and executes the instructions. Uh, the AI of the firm, I'm sorry, the, the runtime of the firm is becoming the AI, so the artificial intelligence. So feeding all of this stuff uh, is a new approach to data. In order to make this work, you got to industrialize the approach to processing data. And this is what we call in the book, the AI factory, which is really fundamentally using industrial techniques to uh, gather the data, clean the data, normalize the data, integrate the data. This is the end of spreadsheets. You know, the way most of us deal with data is, you know, we get the spreadsheet, we fiddle with the data a little bit, then we plot it, and then we fiddle with it some more, then like it, we plot it again, we try to do something, maybe run a regression if you're super fancy or whatever. But it's basically the artisanal approach to analyzing data. The way that you have to do it, if you're actually gonna operate the company on it in a scalable way, is you have to build a data factory like this, where you have a data pipeline to clean and normalize the data, you have algorithm development to go and print out the algorithms that you need, the infrastructure development. And literally the process can take place anywhere in the company. If you do it well, you can have anyone that can come in and literally have the skill sets and capability to go and deploy these algorithms and enable the processes in a new way. So this is what feeds the operating model core of the firm. Now, this is really different from the firms, uh, the way the firms have been uh, structured traditional. Traditional firms uh, work uh, in, you know, sort of with, with a bunch of different organizations that kind of come together, they have a siloed structure. You know, you have the business unit over here, business unit over there, you have manufacturing function over here, marketing function over there. These silos, these, these organizations, these components uh, are built essentially to make humans manageable, right? If you make the organization too large and too open, it's very difficult to manage it. So you have hierarchies of organizational uh, influence and you have individual silos. Now, when 10 and 20 and 30 years of IT started to flow into the firms, that technology went into the silos themselves to essentially make the silos work a little better. But fundamentally, 
uh, taking an organization that was designed by humans and for humans, and it's been done that way for hundreds of years, uh, and using technology to make that organization work a little better. That's not how and financial works at all. And by the way, one of the things of these traditional organizations is that they have diminishing returns. As they get bigger, they become, lo- lo- become harder and harder to manage. And so the actual value that can be delivered flattens out. You know, it's, it's sort of common. You go into an organization, it's too big. They have too many products. Customer service starts not to work anymore. The products themselves are not well thought through and so on and so forth. Then you have all these diminishing returns that cut off the value that organization uh, delivers. Organizations like Ant don't work that way. Uh, they have very little value when the scale is small. Around the, like a payment, a payment service with no users uh, is useless. You need to have millions and maybe even billions of people on this thing before it becomes really, really, really useful. Or a social network like Facebook, not very useful with no people in it. And so uh, as the organization scales, the value curve is, uh, you know, sort of, is really an exponential. It's, it's a power law curve. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's literally a viral curve as it expands uh, and increases rapidly as the uh, company itself does not have the traditional bottlenecks. And so the way you build a company like this, to build an organization like an Ant Financial, you build it with a horizontal layer of data technology that can be rapidly deployed to enable any process you want. So because the data doesn't need the boundaries, they don't need the, the organizational subunits that can go out there and enable any process across the board. And this is how these organizations work. And we've seen a bunch of them clashing with traditional organizations. Before the pandemic, Airbnb built very much like an Ant Financial uh, for allocating uh, sort of you know, travel uh, reservations, rooms, and so on, competing with Marriott, uh, very different terms, going for the same customers for very different ways, Ford versus Waymo or Uber, organizations structured very differently to deliver cars as a service, uh, essentially you know, making the hard car hardware much less relevant, traditional banks like HSBC against uh, companies like Ant Financial. So um, all kinds of interesting, uh, all kinds of interesting things. This is fundamentally has become the, the essentially the, the predicament of many traditional organizations from the Harvard Business School onto HSBC, confronted by organizations with very different kinds of business models. So I just wanted to um, get one of the figures from your Harvard Business Review article uh, because, as far as I remember, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, and financial serves 10 times the number of customers than the largest U.S. banks, but at 10 times lower the cost. Is that, are those the correct ratios? Oh, uh, I think, it, well, uh, 10 times less, uh, uh, 10, well, uh, more than 10, I think 100 times fewer people uh, is wow. the thing. So it's, uh, it's really the, the, the number of customers that it delivers is quite large, and you're talking about a billion people. Bank of America is at around 100 million, and that's huge uh, in terms of the number of customers for a traditional bank. Uh, and in terms of the number of employees, I think Bank of America is around 100,000 plus. No, it's a factor of 10. 100,000 plus in financial is about 10,000, so about a factor of 10 in employees. And of course, in financial performs many more functions and delivers many more services than Bank of America does. And by the way, Bank of America is actually pretty good. Like they have good information technology. They've got good data scientists in there. They're actually not a bad example. Uh, Kareem likes to dump on them a lot, but actually they're, if you look at the metrics, they're not, they're not so bad. And even so, uh, the labor productivity in financial financial is essentially 100 times as much. Fundamentally a different type of thing. So, you know, we had this little crazy pandemic thing, right? And uh, and uh, in, in some countries, uh, it's better. In some countries, it's still a mess. But uh, from our perspective, um, in Boston and in the U.S., a lot of things really happened around March, right? So this thing has, had been building up since January and February. Few people noticed. Uh, but uh, by March, all of a sudden, everybody in the U.S. kind of freaked out. And you can see this is mobile data that shows the difference in distance traveled that collapses in a period of about two weeks, right? So from March 9th, right there, uh, to March, uh, essentially, 20th, um, uh, mobility just comes down by, by 70%. 
sorry, is that from Google Maps or where are you getting? This is from, this is mobile data. This is, uh, I, uh, I don't remember which actual, I should have a source here. I don't know which actually mobile provider was a smaller company. Okay. It does a lot of this, but basically, you know, people, you can get, tra- so people track anonymously who is going where. And so this company provides a service that basically ties you so how much mobility there is in individual states is so they can actually put together an index of mobility that tells you people have stopped moving around and people have essentially social distance at home. And so essentially in two weeks, everything changed, right? Everything changed in two weeks. Uh, and all of a sudden you see uh, AI and digital transformation, which up until March in the U.S. was essentially nice to have and a nice to do, to all of a sudden has become the difference between staying in business and shutting down, right? Because if you, if you can't, if you're in the social distance world, uh, you either kind of virtualize the work and work from home and try to automate what you can virtualize or else uh, you're basically a risk of the infection performing some very important uh, duties and so on. But uh, in many cases, uh, really challenging uh, uh, sort of from a health perspective and so on. And, uh, and the world really, really changed. And so we're seeing, uh, you know, there's difference. And, and we have all these crazy new companies like that we're thinking about. Like Moderna is an interesting example, right? Moderna is uh, the, so far, is, is essentially an, an, an financial of biotech. Okay, so digital operating model, digital data platform, the technology is mRNA, which is essentially the, they call it the software of life. It's really the code that instructs the body on which, which proteins to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to develop. And so it's, it's a way to develop uh, a vaccine. Um, and right now they're first in line uh, in the U.S., uh, among the vaccine development com- uh, companies. They're essentially in phase three at this point in time with some pretty promising results. And the thing that's amazing, if you look over here at the timeline, you have uh, so from January 11th uh, to February 7th, 25 days, that is the amount of time that it took them to do this, right? Essentially, you're just you know, reading the, the sequence, generating uh, sort of your own uh, essentially programming instructions, to generate the first vaccine batch in a system that's, uh, that's fundamentally largely automated. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you've got companies like Mass General. Mass General is older than the Harvard Business School. It's pretty ancient, not by British standards, but uh, you know, it's 210 years old. Um, it's been around for, for quite some time. <clears throat> and you can see them deploying digital technology every, everywhere they possibly can. And taking a 210-year-old technology, super crusty and old-fashioned in many ways, but driving massive digital transformation, going overnight to telemedicine. This is my friend Kelly Whitbold who talks about this. She's a telemedicine fellow and an, and an emergency uh, medicine uh, attending physician at Mass General. Uh, and she's like, I've there's been more change in the last two weeks, uh, basically, or the last... Uh, the last three weeks than I've seen in the last 10 years uh, in terms of digital transformation, deployment of AI. And they're using bots. They're using all kinds of simple AI to reduce the load on the human staff, right? So moving as much of the process as possible to artificial intelligence so that the nurse doesn't sit there and answer a customer's uh, or, or, or a potential patient's uh, unnecessary phone calls. There's a bit of triage that's done by AI. And so it frees up their time to do some of the things that are incredibly valuable. And so you can see a lot of digital transformation uh, driving change uh, within these, uh, within, within, uh, within traditional organizations. And so, you know, lots of different, uh, lots of different opportunities, uh, lots of different challenges. Uh, You can sort of with COVID, especially we can accelerate the deployment of AI almost anywhere. There's so many different applications, use cases, scenarios, uh, at the same time, it's also generating all kinds of new ethical questions about privacy and so on. And so the amount of transformation that we're seeing in the last few weeks has just been incredible. And some of it has been exciting and super interesting and, and a lot of potential. Some of it has been terrifying and bringing up all kinds of issues around privacy, issues around bias, issues around a digital divide getting deeper between those that are IT knowledge workers and those that are not, big differences. And so 
first of all, you know, I'm, thank you for coming and listening in uh, to me raving about this stuff. It's really great to, to, to have you here. Look forward to the questions. Uh, thank you for, you know, sort of being interested in understanding and anticipating a little bit what's happening here. Uh, and it's an interesting time where we're seeing AI being deployed at an even faster rate, um, sort of think about the importance of this new kind of firm and, this, and the importance of architecture as a drive transformation. And then thinking about, a little bit about sort of what uh, some people are starting to get increasingly worried about the new ethics of digital skill scope and learning and all the repercussions that this will have as we figure out how to deal with an economy going forward as the pandemic hopefully hopefully uh, gets back under control at some point. Uh, uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. is looking at Europe with a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of envy right now. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, as we do this, deal with the consequences of an increasingly digitized and increasingly AI-centric world uh, with an increasing fraction of the population, that's an increasingly great need because of um, not being able to participate in all of this. If you want to hear the rest of this masterclass where we cover things like pig facial recognition technology and how to make a Rembrandt using artificial intelligence and much, much more, then sign up to Tech for Techies membership and the link is in the show notes. And if you enjoyed this episode, which I hope you did, then please give us a rating and a review. That would help other people who are interested in discovering tech content for non-techies discover this podcast. On that note, thanks for listening and have a lovely day.